Um, if at any point you want to veer, I want the conversation to be as organic as possible. So it's not like a big scripted, like, you know, robotic situation. Um, just to let you know my backdrop, I am a visual artist. That, that's my career path. Um, I've been doing it for quite a while. So I either I create art or I teach art. And social epidemiology is a passion of mine outside of the art. Because I do believe that art is a part of public health. And so on the back end, I, I'm like, I nerd out with, documentaries and digging up research and stuff all on my own <laughs> but I never really published anything and so this is my I guess introduction to community research so um, yeah so please bear along with me no I love it I love it uh, you know go for it <laughs> thank yeah. you all right so if you don't mind stating your name for individuals that you are not familiar with I'm Dr. Monica Unsell Okay, and if you could just let us know your discipline or career path, what is your occupation? Huh. Interesting question. Um, actually, I'm tr a trained biologist um, and, and trained in biology and public health. I currently work for the Greater Louisville Project as their director of community engagement because something I've been doing for over a decade is environmental justice advocacy work. I also just founded a group called Data for Justice so that's going to hopefully be launching here soon. So that's kind of who I am. It's kind of scattered, but I like it that way. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a big a myriad of things. Yeah. Right. But it's all geared towards social justice. Yes. But just in different avenues. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, today we're talking about public health, public art how they interplay, and then also social justice thrown in there, how we can change the conversation um, about different uh, <clears throat> issues going on in the city of Louisville currently, but through an art lens. And so the first question I have for you, as a racially identified minority, how does the lack of racial diversity within your employment industry, if so, impact your sense of identity? So. Um, it act, it does impact my sense of identity on the one hand, being the only black woman or the only black person in the room can be intimidating because you want to watch what you say. You don't want to be seen as the aggressor because as soon as we say anything, we could be labeled a threat. But on the other hand, I feel empowered to bring more people that look like me into the room um, so that they can speak for themselves. And I don't have to, I don't want to be like the black person who represents all of black Louisville. That's impossible. But I do feel that if I'm in a space where I'm the only black person or the only black woman, that I can use that opportunity to say, hey, we need to make sure these other people are at this next meeting um, or else it's just not going to work. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you in advance uh, for your continual efforts to integrate more uh, just not the, the language of trending diversity and inclusion because it is very trendy right now yeah. um, and very performative in many ways but you want to make sure that it's long term <clears throat> long term uh, effect so do you believe that there are barriers within the arts community to access opportunities information and equal pay among black and brown artists entrepreneurs or business owners um well i will say you know i'm not very familiar with the arts community since i'm a scientist however as an observer just think about how in school when we'd go to art museums you learn the renaissance paintings we learn that style like that's what that was what was considered art right not an african mask it was something by a painter in florence italy it was leonardo da vinci those were the, the things that we looked at the sculpture of you know david Michelangelo's work we didn't hear about anything that we did you know our they called us our things our art artifacts and they stuck them in history museums because they were just things that someone dug up and found and stole they didn't put them in an art museum to say this is to be appreciated this is to be enjoyed someone was expressing themselves through this and I remember like going to the speed museum and seeing like the medieval knights and just wondering, like, when was I going to see a black person? Like, 
Like, where, like, <laughs> where, where can I see in anything in this museum that looks like me? Did we not right. eat? Were we not painting? Were we not drawing? Were we not doing sculptures? Um, I'm very fortunate that my mother's, uh, one of my mother's best friends is the wife of Mr. Ed Hamilton. And when we were kids, we would sometimes go to his studio and see his work and we would go to openings and his events. So I, I got to be exposed to it that way. And I'm very, I feel like I'm very fortunate that that just happened to be one of my mother's best friends. That I got to see a black artist, a black sculptor, but growing up, absolutely not and in business in the sciences i'm always amazed that people think that academia is liberal because academia is extremely <laughs> racist it's a country club for old white men um <laughs> it, it, I'm, I'm always shocked when they're like i'm like actually no i left academia it was so racist you know that i was like i'm out um and it's so sexist because they wanted to call me miss unselled instead of doctor um, but there are those barriers there. I told someone yesterday, I was in graduate school working on my doctorate and I still was not sure if it was gonna happen because my fate was still in the hands of a committee that was all white people. So there was still some control that I did not have and I did not know if the wrong white person was gonna say, no, I'm not gonna sign off on that dissertation. And I remember when I gave my dissertation, one person said that I was too informal when I gave it. But I've participate I've been participating in these reclaiming STEM workshops and we're, you know, I'm just realizing that other people of color have had that experience and that like the way that we speak is not considered professional because what was considered professional is from white supremacy and patriarchy. No one ever asked us what we consider professional and so the fact that I don't speak like a robot when I present makes me somehow unprofessional so the barriers are still very much there I do feel I do have degrees and that does give me some privilege I do get into rooms um, I do get invited to meetings I do get invited in, you know, into events people want to hear me speak so but on the other hand, because of those initials, I can't necessarily burn things down like I want to. You know? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> people are like, oh, you, you posted that? Or, you you know, and I'm thinking like, maybe I should, you know, just step back and say, no, this has got to, this has got to be dismantled. This is who it is. But it, it's that toss up because if people think they want me in the room, I have to be on that email list so that I can forward it on to someone else. So I kind of have to like suck and jive, which I don't like that term, but I, I feel like I'm kind of having to do that just so I can forward on the emails and say, here's an opportunity, here's some money, here's, you know, they're, they need a group, they're forming a group. This is what they're talking about to do that. So it's difficult. Yeah. <laughs>